Welcome back to the Road to City Hall. A recent survey by the Trust for Public Land declared that New York City has the second best park system in the country behind Minneapolis. Ever since Mayor Bloomberg took office in 2002, the budget for public parks has increased from $210 million to over $338 million. But with the city facing a big fiscal crunch in the coming years, could parks see a big cutback? Joining me to talk about that and some of the disparities in funding and upkeep of the parks around the city, we've got former Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe, who is now a senior vice president for the Trust for Public Land. Holly Light is the executive director at New Yorkers for Parks. Laura Starr is the president of the New York chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. And Jeffrey Croft is here from NYC Parks Advocates. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming in. And I'll, let me start with you, Commissioner. Um, you, part of your legacy, you spent quite a lot of time there and transformed the park system in many ways, is this, this, uh, this construct of conservancies that help uh, augment the upkeep and the basic operation of, of several of the parks. And that has been sort of a, 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 point, a point of contention. I'm wondering if you could, I mean, was that your intention? Is it, was it the best way around uh, a funding challenge, or is it a positive good in and of itself? I think they're nothing but positive. And, you know, in truth, the, the major conservancies came to life long before me. They, in fact, they started under Mayor Koch and Parks Commissioner Gordon Davis, and then under Henry Stern. So the Central Park Conservancy, the Prospect Park Alliance, the Battery Conservancy, all of those started well in advance of the Bloomberg administration. So. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they grew and some new ones were born, but there's a, a wonderful tradition of New Yorkers being generous. And they're generous to hospitals and to universities and to cultural institutions and libraries. And then they started to add parks to that mix. And the result is about $165 million a year every year in private funds for public parks. Now, other cities across the country are trying to imitate that, and some are doing it quite successfully. There's major projects in Dallas, in St. Louis, in Louisville in Los Angeles where they're doing public-private partnerships, but they don't have that concentration of wealth and philanthropy which is sort of unique to New York. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that is that it allows the city to take its public dollars and allocate them to the vast majority of parks that don't get any private support. There's about 10 parks in all of New York City that get significant private support and just a, a handful that get a, a whole lot of money. And, and um, for you, Jeffrey Croft, uh, that is in itself a, a sort of a problem or a challenge, right? That the, the ones that are maybe on the outside of the well-funded uh, parks end up suffering. No, absolutely. An experience with uh, public partnerships in the last 30 years has um, certainly proven, as everyone is aware, um, it's created an enormous disparity. Um, you can't have a uh, um, park system funded, especially in wealthy areas, um, that are not, um, you know, look, the parks are supposed to be funded by city funds, and they're, they're not. Each year, the government allocates a fraction of the funds needed to properly maintain and program and secure our parks. And, and what's happening now is that we've created these, you know, this two and tier class system of, of parklands. So you have a, a central park, for instance, who's, uh, you know, $47 million. 85% uh, of that is uh, privately funded. And you have, I mean, parks all over the city uh, that are literally falling apart. And, you know, we've, we've been dealing with this for, you know, more yeah, you've than taken some pictures that we're uh, we're showing right here of uh, of uh, of some of the some of the parks that are um, less well funded. Sure, and I think that's Highbridge there. I was just up there recently. That's Highbridge, and and the image before that was actually just taken a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I mean, and you have a comparison between Central Park and Jackie Ro Robinson Park, where mm -hmm. again, uh, the fields were you know a day af after six inches of rain, and the very same time photographs taken in cen in Central Park. Park, they are not only dry fields, but they had been dragged and, and maintained. Mm -hmm. The infields had, had actually been, been dragged. That's in Marine Park in, uh, in, 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 there's in Brooklyn. A, there's a phony premise to play here. The phony premise is this, that there's rich parks and poor parks. That would um, say to you that only rich people get to use Central Park, but last time I checked, Central Park had East Harlem, Central Harlem, and West Harlem at its northern end. Central Park, Prospect Park, these are parks for all the people. And when wealthy people give money to support a public park that 
provides for all the people, that's a great thing. It's a really good thing. You have to have a really negative point of view to say it's wrong for people to be supporting parks. The, the, the idea that Prospect Park is a park only for the rich people, completely a, a fabulous fantasy. No, no, believe you know, me, I, I go there all the time. And I Prospect rich. Park okay, but, is used by everybody. And so, and it's a complete but, fantasy. But, 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 and the idea that New York is not spending money well, on parks well, well, is a fantasy. I don't, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's really it's what a, It's a complete fantasy. I, I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouth, but I don't think that's what the argument is. I think no, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the question what I heard come out of is, is um, whether or not parks uh, in all places are getting funds in a, in a comparable way. In your but point. just to back up from that, I started working in Central Park in 1980 when it was in a really bad state of repair. It looked like these pictures of the other parks you're showing. It was a big dust bowl. It was a big yeah. dust bowl, and the, a lot of the the real estate around Central Park did not have anything close to the value that it has today. Mm -hmm. And I was the first landscape hire there to implement the master plan. And the thing I can say about park conservancies is you get the brain trust of New York at the boardroom table of the conservancies. And they figure out how to raise the money, how to create the vision for the park. Central Park did a management and restoration plan that set out a vision for turning what was mud and dust and clogged drains into what you see today. And laying out the vision, then they could raise the funds and they could figure out how to train crews specifically to prune the trees, to save the elms, to restore the rustic shelters, to clean the lakes, to teach children about ecology. All of these programs that can now be exported to other parks and this management system is in fact being exported by the Central Park Conservancy to other parks, to a lot of the parks you're mentioning. They go in and help them. They were on Staten Island after Sandy. So I think that, you know, and, and also recently our office, um, my, my my other job is a partner at Star White House Landscape Architects. We were working on the Sandy recovery with the mayor's office, and there was this brain trust there of putting together people who understood economy with ecology, with community development. Well, you, you, you've said, Holly, that um, there, we, we could improve, say, the transparency and Absolutely. the disclosure about what goes on in the conservancy. Right? Yeah, I think it is a misnomer. There, There is inequity issues. Not every park is equally beautiful. There's no question about that, but I think it's a huge misnomer to point to conservancies as the reason for that. And I actually think that by focusing so much energy on conservancies, we're missing the opportunity to talk about this and have a dialogue about how do we make all parks more equitably cared for. And I think it's a problem to, to focus just on conservancy. You know what, you are right, and we're going to get into some of those other issues right after a short break, then we will continue this Sound Off segment on parks in just a moment. And remember, if you'd like to get involved in the conversation, you can do it on Twitter. We're at Errol Lewis or at Road to City Hall. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Road to City Hall, where we are talking about the state of the public parks with Adrian Benepe, Holly Light, Laura Starr, and Jeffrey Croft. And, um, Commissioner, let me ask you this. We, we've been going on these tours of all of the city council districts, and they inevitably point to some of the parks where they had what looks to me like a very significant role in the planning and the funding and the, the timetable for doing some very basic stuff, in some cases drainage systems and, and so on. When you were commissioner, w wouldn't you have preferred that the Parks Department just do that without a lot of this political well, you know, you, You'd love to have a blank check saying spend as much as you like on any park you like. That would be the preferred idea, but the, it has always been the tradition that city council members, borough presidents get to allocate some capital dollars, and they can allocate it for whatever they like. Our view was put it into parks because you'll see it spent efficaciously and fast and you'll provide a public service for tens of thousands of constituents as opposed to maybe funding one classroom or mm -hmm. a piece of a housing project. And it's been that way for decades. Um, ideally, you'd like to have a, a larger, more discretionary budget to do things. But on the other hand, this mayor that we're currently under has been putting half a billion dollars every year for 12 years into park renovations. That's an extraordinary amount. It dwarfs the next 10 or 20 cities put together. The rest of the country wishes they had the kind of funding that New York is allocating for parks. Except not, not for maintenance, though. I mean, and, and that's a problem. The, uh, the budget just, just passed now. Again, $290 million allocated in, in, in tax levy funds for the maintenance and operation of parks. That's less than, that's far less than half a percent for an agency that's responsible for 14 percent of the city's land. So again, decade after decade. When, when Robert Moses leaves office, 1.4 percent in May of 1960, 1.4 percent was allocated to parks. The, the elected officials decade after, after decade have li literally starved our parks system. So the photographs, and again, we've taken tens of thousands of them. So when you see the enormous disparity 
Um, and, and, and look, there's no secret that it affects uh, you know, the middle class, poor people, uh, people predominantly of, of, of color. And this is a huge issue. Yes, we can put money into capital, which by the way is still a fraction of the funds in capital that a neglected park system for over four decades. We're, we're, we're just, you know, um, trying to catch up. So but I think it it's is not just a rich poor issue. And I do think there's some right. complexities with the council system because there's some council members who are very interested in parks. They will allocate more money. And that's not necessarily just aligned with poor neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods. It's kind of all over the place. And I do think that having more flexible capital money for the Parks Department to do more long-term planning, a 10-year plan where they know how much money is going to be there for different kinds of projects and can really plan on what are the greatest needs in each borough for the next 10 years and, and be sure that those can get funded and not have to rely on this political system. That's part of what you're calling for around the next mayor to be committed to. Yes, we have a parks platform that we've worked on with over 100 advocates around the city. And, what, and by far the biggest thing that has come up is make sure that the parks department can do the planning and has the money to be able to really plan for the neediest parks citywide. And I would add that I think the parks department does an extraordinary job, and I think um, disparaging them is simply wrong. The parks are in good to excellent shape. Your own report card says that. It says that they've been getting better. The, the city, New York City, is the only city that does its own report card. And I can tell you from having seen the top 20 cities in America, New York City does a better job of taking care of its parks than almost every other city. Uh, and the, the average park is in great shape. And money has been invested. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg added 600 new staff in the last year's budget. So look, could you always have more? Sure you could. But the reality is that you know, there are a lot of city services that are mandated by by court decisions, by legal decisions, by civil service rules. That's why that percentage has shrunk because so many other costs are mandated by law and stuff like that. And, and, the, and that's why yeah. conservancies yeah. are a good thing. Let me ask you this, Laura. Do you, do you have a sense um, that among the landscape architects that, uh, that you're doing sort of um, patchwork, that you're just s sort of running from behind to keep up? Or do you feel like there's enough commitment to sort of really well, ensure the, the excellence of all of the Well, there's two important things to say from the landscape architectural perspective. One is that landscape architects under working in the Bloomberg administration, we've had the opportunity to create a completely different vision for parks in the city that are productive parks that are handling stormwater, that are protecting the city from wave action and storm surge in hurricanes. So the role of parks and landscape architecture has changed and parks are becoming multi-layered and multi-dimensional and which is a huge funding opportunity because it means that the Department of Environmental Protection can send some stormwater to a park and we can create a wetland there and it can be a beautiful meditative and educational place and they have money mm -hmm. and they're under consent order to manage stormwater differently so they have to do it there should be you know there can be a much more reciprocal relationship between parks and the community because parks vastly affect real estate value as the real estate value is increased there's more opportunity for developers to then you know reciprocate and help fund the parks there's so many opportunities out there so i think landscape architects have been in leadership roles on these projects and that's our training so so we see an open frontier but the second question is to see our work not maintained is extremely painful and there is a huge maintenance problem, not just for parks, but for the green infrastructure program that's coming out. Where New York City will see vast amounts of gardens on the streets handling stormwater. There's, there's a big need for training of gardeners and people to maintain landscapes in the city. So and we need a budget for that, and, and, and that's the problem, well, or yeah. or we need a private not-for-profit that will a series of private not-for-profits that will do it because you know I I actually am a big believer in private not-for-profits because. It, you can get a big brain trust there. Okay, more for the next mayor to consider. Thank you all so much for what turned into a brainstorming session. Thanks a whole lot. We're going to take a short break now. I'll be back with the results of tonight's Snap Poll and a preview of tomorrow night's